the church whanau. It's good to be back with you all. I feel like I haven't preached in ages, so uh, I feel rusty. So we're going to get into it tonight. Um, we've had some great uh, talks in the series, haven't we? And we're up to week five. And this week is all about simplicity. And uh, it, it'll, seem, it'll seem strange if you haven't been here for four weeks and you haven't been listening to what's been going on because there's been some fantastic talks and we do keep them online uh, on our website. So you need to go and get a hold of those and watch them because I think our four preachers, two of them who haven't preached before here, Susan and Clint, did an amazing job on sign down and Sabbath. So uh, get a hold of those. <clears throat> if you're just joining us, we, uh, we being me, Monica, and Clint, we've, uh, we've been reading this book here by John Mark Comer, and we've been talking about it each week. Um, and it was something that really inspired us uh, after the COVID season to say, what do we need to do to reset? What do we need to do as a community to place Jesus back at the center of all that is important to us? And that is to get back into old school spiritual disciplines. Uh, and everyone's like, spiritual disciplines, that's not what we've been talking about. That's exactly what we've been talking about. And so uh, we got a couple more weeks of this uh, to go. So we encourage it, keep leaning in and listening. Uh, I think this is a series that will really add value to us in the long run if we start putting some of these things into practice, right? Uh, some of you have already gone, I've taken that one thing that Monica said, and I've taken that one thing that Pastor Eric said. I remember Clint talking about this. I remember Susan talking about this. This is the point. We slowly add those ones and twos. We're not trying to tell you to renovate your entire life in one weekend, okay? We listen, we comprehend, we hear what God might be saying to us in this moment, and we make a little change. And so I encourage you to that. We live in a time where we are time poor people. We live in a time where we are hurried and that we are in a consumption focused humanity. And I don't think any of us could disagree with that. Uh, I would say most of us, if not all of us, are craving a little bit more space and time to ourselves. How many hands are out there? Oh, no one. No, come on. Yeah, there's a few of us. All want a bit of space and time and freedom to do with what we want. But life is closing in on us. And I guess our goal in this series is to uh, help us find and create space for life in the midst of our chaos. And you go, I, I don't want to add something more to my life to try and give myself more freedom. I want to take things away. Tonight's one of those nights where you can take things away. Uh, it's about being freedom, uh, being free for what really matters. And uh, we've been hearing a little bit more about that. So it's all about this word simplicity. Now, how many of you, this will be new to you tonight, simplicity? There's a few? No? You're all, you're all schooled on simplicity. I can just ask you to share a little story or two of how you've radically changed your life and done something practical. I, uh, I decided I'd try and find my two favorite uh, definitions of uh, simplicity. And the first is by a guy called Josh Becker. He's a former uh, pastor, and he's now a writer on minimalism. And he says this, and this is how he describes simplicity. He says, it's the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of everything that distracts us from them. It's powerful, isn't it? It's a powerful thing. We all go, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It's very hard to live by. <laughs> the second one comes from, I would say, the guru. I'd say the guru of spiritual disciplines. His name's Pete, uh, Richard Foster. I was going to say Peter Foster. <laughs> he wishes. Um, <laughs> Richard Foster. Richard Foster is the guru of uh, discipline. That book there, The Celebration of Discipline, has been sold millions and millions of times. And, and he says this about simplicity. He says, simplicity is an inward reality that can be seen in an outward lifestyle of choosing to leverage time, money, talents, and possessions oof, toward what matters most. How good is that? All right, that's the end of the sermon. Come back next week for now. I'm just... But that's, that's where we're going tonight, okay? So simplicity is at its very heart, an inward change that results in an outward change, okay? Leveraging our time, money, talents, and possessions. So throughout church history, uh, followers of Jesus have vowed into a life of simplicity. 
or to live simply. It's, it's about giving up comfort and possessions, yes, and the other clutter of life that makes a greater space for us to see Jesus working in us, for loving God and loving others, as the Gospels tell us. And it's one of those things where we, we go, oh, do we, do we jump into um, spiritual discipline so that we can win favor with God? I hope we all know that we don't win favor with God. The work is already done. We accept Jesus in a sacrifice. Or maybe some of you think, oh, well, this will make me more impressive with my peers because I am so holy, I am so disciplined, uh, I'm doing this to show off. No, it's about creating margin in our life. It's about creating space and openness in our lives. It's to be able to take a breath. For some of us, it might be to enjoy a sunrise. How many of you enjoyed a sunrise recently? Very few young adults. Did you see that? Very few. Sunrise is not one of those things they get to see much of, unless they are working. For me, it's, it's taking time to, to lie in bed with my youngest daughter and read a story and just, if I want to, fall asleep there with her. This is the space that we're trying to create for ourselves. It's, it's about freeing ourselves, liberating ourselves, letting go of some of our kind of Western entitlement that we've become so accustomed to, enjoying simple pleasures that, that cost nothing, uh, downsizing our possessions. How many came for that tonight? Oh, a few, a few. That's good. I'm glad to see that. We'll see by the end of the night. Uh, it's even about eating simply. What? Eating simply wrong. You see, the, the pleasures of this world come in and they cram it out. Simplicity is an entire world of discovering rhythm, of discovering pace, and discovering freedom. Now, having had the privilege on many occasions, probably a dozen, of sitting with people right at the end of their life, and I'm talking to them and we're praying together and I've heard over and over uh, just the, the words that, that showed value for what was life for them. None of them said to me, oh, Rob, I wished in my time I had spent that valuable evening finishing off the 72 episodes on Netflix. Very few of them <laughs> have ever said to me, oh, Rob, I wish I was at work so much more during my life. I wish I'd spent more time uh, doing things that were just self-centered and, and all about me. No, but what people talk about on their deathbed is more time, more freedom, more being with their family, more enjoying conversation. All the things that Jesus encourages us to do to truly see life and understand life. And there is this adjustment that we all need to make for the sake of life as it should be. But for about 50 to 80 years, I would say, Western countries have been sucked into this vortex of hurry. The busyness, this upward mobility and consumption that we, we didn't even realize that we'd become slaves to. And some of us go, I've heard this before, Rob. You see, we've been slowly molded, and I would say even culturally manipulated, into consumptive monsters. Uh, think about the, the TV program, Storage Wars. How many of you watch Storage Wars? Yeah, they got a bargain. The most crazy thing about Storage Wars is that people are forgetting to pay the Jews on a, uh, a garage full of crap that they'd forgotten about. Because their other garage that they have at their house is already full of crap. And then they stop paying payments and someone else gets their stuff. What a TV program. That is the kind of TV program that could only exist in the 21st century. Here, here's all of my stuff that I have collected and I've forgotten about. Please buy it for $250. Garages. I think about, I don't know if this is the same in your neighborhood, but I walk around my street. No one's garage is used for cars anymore. It's full of stuff. Like this guy moved in, uh, in our street uh, last year, and uh, I, I thought, oh, look, they've put all of the boxes in the garage, and they're going to slowly take them all apart and put them into the house. Those boxes are still there a year and a half later. 
That was just the stuff for his garage. Everything else was in the house. No cars fit in that garage. There's about 15 bikes in that garage. There's two people who live in that house. This is the world we've, we've come to know. And we're convinced through advertising and media that we must be, we must have, we must do X, Y, or Z to be a better person, to be a better mother, to get more views and to get more likes, to have the latest or greatest of this or that because some influencer told me or because some celebrity is promoting it. We're being sucked in to that world. And one of the things that we often forget is that there is an inbuilt, and this is going to sound crazy, there is an inbuilt planned obsolescence in products that drives our consumptive priority. Stuff is made to break, so you buy more stuff. Okay? Uh, most of you have got a phone in your pocket. It's probably about your fifth or sixth phone. Why? Because they made them just big enough so that in three years' time, you don't have enough memory space on there to hold all the apps and all the things and all the photos that you need. So you have to buy the next thing. And we go, oh, yeah, we'll buy the next thing. That makes sense to us. Wake up. <laughs> it's planned. It's planned so you continue to consume and, and fill their tanks. What do you mean by this, Rob? Well, companies make, keep making money because things break down. They don't make things to last forever anymore. I remember so many people over 50 saying that to me when I was about 20. They just don't make things like they used to. No, because they realize they don't make any money if you keep it forever. They want you to buy another one. Phones, computers, cars, the carpet in your house, clothing, they make even more money if it's cheaper. And they can make it cheaper. And they can make it in a country that's not this country. They can make it in that country where they can pay this much for other people to make it. And if they go to that country, they can buy those products that are not biodegradable, those things that won't last forever, that break very easily in that country as well. And you know what? It poisons that country instead of this country. You see where I'm going with it? The things that we consume, the things that we put our possessions uh, a value we put on our possessions destroys other places sometimes. Simplicity is about not allowing that to happen. We're going deeper with simplicity tonight. You see, often we uh, find ourselves buying things we don't want to impress people we don't like. Let's face it, that's, that's a lot of who we are. And the more we, we do that, the more we need to borrow and and the money, we, 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 we can't repay it back. We work more hours to try and get more money to pay back what we owe to chase the next thing. And we're told that we must have that thing so that we can be what? Happy. So that we can be happy. That's what advertising is all about. They bend over backwards to make us think our wants are actually needs. John Mark Comer in this book, he says, as Western wealth and technology continues to rise, many psychologists point out that our happiness is not increasing at the same pace. In fact, some studies indicate that as a nation, as wealth goes up, its happiness goes down. What? Hey, is that me? It's me. Am I twisting too much? And then Logan's going to come to me and he's going to fix while I talk. It's all right? Eventually. No, I'm moving. It's good. All right. So what do we do, Rob? What do we do? Do we go bush? Do we dig a hole for our toilet? Build some huts? Cut off the electricity? Cut up our credit cards? Well, no, that's not actually what we need. In fact, it won't fix the problem because the problem isn't stuff. The problem is that we put no limit on stuff due to our insatiable human desire for more. And we think that we need all sorts of things to be happy when in actuality we need very few, very few things. These past school holidays, I was that horrible parent who went home at lunchtime and pulled out the internet. School holidays. Kids at home, you know, they knew dad was coming at lunchtime and he was going to take the wire 
that makes internet work away. And there was tears to start off with and not very happy. No, what are we, oh, we going to do with our lives? Isn't it funny? What happened? They played a board game together. They went outside, saw the sun, <laughs> breathed fresh air, went for a ride on their bike. Oh, such a horrible father. The spiritual discipline of simplicity asks a lot of uncomfortable questions of us. What priority does Jesus and the kingdom take in your everyday? And what place do the things of this world take in reflection of that? Point one, point two. You see, one of the other things that I stumbled across this week was this quote. As we, consuming, as we are consuming things, or are we consuming things, or are they consuming us? Do we possess things, or are they possessing us? So we now get to the meaning in life by, we, we get meaning in life often now by what we consume. And we are known or make ourselves known by our habits, our things, how we spend our time, what we spend it with. Bible commentators uh, of the New Testament Gospels, they, they, they say that over 25% of what Jesus talked about was to do with wealth, money, and possessions. There's a reason why Jesus focused here. Let me list a few other awkward and unavoidable lines that we find in the New Testament. Here's one from uh, one of the parables. One thing you lack, sell your possessions and give it to the poor. What was Jesus saying? He was saying to the rich young ruler, you value this over me. So sell this and show me that you value me. Mm. No way, Jesus. He walks away sad because he had so much. What about these words? Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothes? Yikes. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in, and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. And then Paul's words, I have learned by now to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. There's a great story which I want us to focus on tonight, and it comes from Luke 12. And uh, both uh, Luke and Matthew um, have this story at its very center, and I want to read it with you and just reflect together. Because this is the heart of Jesus' understanding of simplicity. He says, someone in the crowd said to him, "Tell uh, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appoint, appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And this line, this brilliant line, life, the life that Jesus tells us is the right life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I love that. It does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Uh, He's saying the life that you desire, it, it won't get better. You won't find the same enjoyment because you get more, because you have more, because you collect more, because you fill your garage or don't empty your closet. Life doesn't get better because of that. And then he goes on to say, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Is that not the American dream we've been sold? And Jesus is telling this parable. Then he goes on to say, But God said to him, you fool. There's very few places where God calls someone a fool in the Bible. You pay attention. This very night your life will be demanded from you. 
then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Eugene Peterson says it a better way. He says, that's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. Wow. Life isn't about an abundance of possessions. We get to this. But verse 15, life is about what? Well, we're told in Matthew 6.33 what life is. And life is about seeking first, what? The kingdom of God. God and his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. Now, all these things, what's he talking about? You go to Matthew and you read chapter 6. It's an amazing chapter. You go through and what does he say? All these things will be given to you. Giving to the needy, prayer, fasting, treasures in heaven. Do not worry. What's he saying? He's saying to us that the life that we think is life isn't life according to Jesus. And we actually need to find it again. Simplicity leads us to life. And Jesus throughout his ministry teaches us that freedom is not found in having and doing, but in keeping God and his will first in our heart. And for where your heart is, the treasure will be also. There's this great um, truth in, in 1 John 3, and it, it just messes with me every time I hear it because it speaks to my heart. It says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? We go back to Richard Foster's definition of simplicity. What does it start? It starts here. We can, we can do all sorts of things out here, but if it has no root here, it's meaningless. It doesn't produce more fruit. The inward understanding of making God's kingdom and his righteousness first place in our life is the most important thing in our life. It actually acts as the cornerstone for the whole building of faith and life together. Uh, one of the things I want to say here is, it's called a spiritual discipline for a reason. It's a discipline. It's because we have to allow those things to take root in our life, and then they work through persistence outwardly from us. Often uh, we just want to pray um, things like, Lord, uh, just make me like Brussels sprouts and kale, vegan cheese. Do you know there's vegan cheese? Make me like these things, Lord, because that'll make me skinny. That'll make me skinny. It's joyless food, let me just say. But the Holy Spirit whispers back to me, Hey, fatty, if you want to be skinny, walk a little bit more and eat a little bit less. Why does he say that to me? Because you have everything you need to live a life of fruitfulness. You have everything. He's given you everything. You want to be thinner? Eat less and walk more. Am I right, Marshall? There's doctors in the house. That's it. You just nodded. That's a fair, you know, I'll, you can pay me later. <laughs> Eat less, walk more. We want the Holy Spirit to do the work for us, but this is a discipline. You see, the all joking aside, we need to grasp the tension of God's work in us and the outward effort that should be produced from that work in us. There's a great police value, and they say, first be, then do. First be a disciple of Jesus, and the doing will come. If we're transforming inwardly daily, it must have an effect first in your home, then in everything else, your finances and your possessions. And over the last two years, even before the COVID word uh, COVID world made someone very famous. Um, there is, there's this woman who became the high priestess of simplicity. Uh, oh, I forgot to click through to that. The high priestess of simplicity is a little Japanese lady <laughs> called Marie Kondo. <laughs> Got to hear this. 
手放すことは時に罪悪感を感じるものです過去の思いに引きずられてしまうこともありますけれど今がその思いを手放す時ですときめかないものを手放す時は心を込めて送り出しましょう感謝を込めてありがとうございましたと伝えます一つ一つのものと丁寧に向き合って手放すことで初めて自分の過去に型をつけることができますそれはあなたのときめく未来につながっています<笑>ああ I love it. I love it. She became so famous. Why? Because she was telling us what Jesus had already told us. To get joy, does anything spark joy? You need to declutter your life. I actually can't believe how she does origami with t shirts and makes them fit in a box about this big. But go online. She has six rules for life. So I, I took on board this because simplicity is, has a very practical element to it. We have to do one thing start a process. So, what did I do? I went to my wardrobe. They say, declutter your wardrobe. And this, ladies, is going to frighten you. I went to my wardrobe because I didn't want to go to my garage, right? <laughs> so, I went to my wardrobe and I thought to myself, how many t shirts do I have? Take a guess. 12. I love you. 12. I had 33 t shirts. Very few of them sparked joy in my life. And so I thought to myself, do I need 33 t shirts? And,、uh, and so I was going through them、uh, <laughs> this afternoon, and, and here are, this is the result right here. In here is 20 out of the 33 t shirts. Some of these, <laughs> yeah. They're going to go in the Tallulah、uh, box.、Um, no, yeah, don't have to. That's right. More work, more consumption. You're right. The, the reason why I declared my wardrobe, half of those t shirts I haven't worn for more than six months. I bet you if you did the same exercise, you'd find the same thing.、Uh, half of these, my wife doesn't like me wearing either. So they're not going to make, it, make the cut. 20 t shirts that I don't really want. Or need. How can we also get practical and think about how we have been drawn into being consumptive monsters to make good environmental ethical decisions that make sense to who we are? I've got some, we're going to go practical now. We understand that this is something that Jesus wants us to value in our life. We're going to go practical. The first one is, I'm going to give you a few pointers, all right? The first one is, Like me, I want you to choose this week one area of your wardrobe to declutter. Okay? Why? You've heard why. Something is going on when we get rid of stuff, when we make space, when we're not worried about more stuff. If my garage was empty, would I actually really care? The answer is probably no. I'd get on with life without it, but it is full and I will work on it. What about a second part? Choose one area in your garage. To organize men, okay? Make it tidy, not just to make it tidy, to get rid of stuff, okay? What about trying to give something away? I want you to plan a way, possibly, if this is your thing this week, plan a way to be generous this week to someone. Take something and give it away. Not just dump it on their doorstep because they don't need your rubbish in their house. Give something of value away. Or what about this? Try taking a digital fast, fast, not a digital fast. I want you to do it possibly once a week. Choose a day. I know that、um, Susan was talking about how her and Gary put their phones down and they don't deal with those during their Sabbath. Maybe you need to have a digital Sabbath. Maybe it's just for an evening. Maybe it's just for a day. You can read a lot of chapters of a book in that week. I,、uh, I read a stat this week that the average Kiwi spends 10 hours scrolling Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all these kinds of things. 10 hours a week. That's the average. Okay. There's half of the population that do more than that. Okay. Think of it that way.、Um, another one 
at least one evening a week, read or take a walk. Simplifying our life. Why? To give give ourselves space to think, to breathe, to get some exercise. Last one. Choose one thing this week that is more practical than convenient. Uh, I think I've jumped. No, that's right. One more thing. It's to choose those things that are more practical than convenient. So some people might choose to walk to work instead of drive a car. They might choose to catch a bus. Why, why, why? Always ask yourself the question why to try and simplify, to create space to think, to breathe, to pray, to spend some time in the word. I want to encourage you with this. But I also want to encourage you with six rules, okay? Marie Kondo, she has six rules for life. Most of them are garbage, but um, I thought I needed to come up with some good rules of life for you, what sparked joy in you, and I, I really wanted them to be biblically centered. So when it comes to simplicity, I want you to think about buying things for their usefulness and not for their status. Okay? Um, what are you buying because someone else thinks that that's cool and you're trying to impress them? Cut it out. <laughs> this is the first priority. We're buying it for our utility, not its prestige. Too many people buy homes not because they're the best setup for their family uh, or to use them to host and be generous, but to show off. Imagine actually wearing something until it actually wore out. Okay, These are the kind of consumptive practices we want you to think about. And here is my encouragement. Stop trying to impress people with your stuff and impress them with your life. Okay, Let them see you and be impressed by you, not by your fancy shoes or your fancy house. Uh, a life of generosity and humility and of servanthood and honoring God, that's what we're after. Okay, rule number two. Move along because the band's here. Reject anything that is producing an addiction in you. Okay? I am reading this very uncomfortable book at the moment called Digital Minimalism. Choosing a focused life in a noisy world. As I shared earlier, our digital world is creating addicts out of us, and they're doing it on purpose. They spend billions of dollars a year trying to create addicts so that you keep scrolling and keep connecting to what they are doing. I want you to learn how to distinguish between a real need and make a commitment to have a tech-free day or a no-social-media day or something like that. Um, Read a good book. Get into those paces and spaces. All right, third one. Develop a habit of giving things away. Okay? Too many of us just fill up our barns with self, and we see needs and we don't meet them. Okay? Develop a habit of giving away. Do we possess things or are they possessing us? I want to tell you this week, if you find something that's possessing you, I dare you to give it away. There's something in your world that is more important to you than Jesus, more important to you than family time, more important to you than a whole bunch of other things. I dare you to give it away this week. That's your challenge. Uh, What am I up to? Number four or five. Uh, Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Okay? I love going on boats. I've never owned a boat in my life. Why? Because I've had very generous friends who have taken me out on their boat. Um, I've enjoyed it. I think if I had the money to buy one, I probably wouldn't. Not because I don't enjoy boating, because I don't enjoy having to look after the boat. Hey, Most of us don't enjoy having to look after the things that we buy. Um, If I had enough money to buy a Lamborghini, I probably wouldn't. Why? Because you can't drive it as fast as I want to drive it on the road. And you can spend $500 at Hampton Downs and thrash the knackers out of someone else's. Okay? This is what I'm talking about. Minimalizing. All right? Uh, Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Second to last, and one of the most important to me, avoid anything that will breed oppression in others. This is important to me because this is about simplifying our consumption of products that don't create ethical or moral problems in other cultures. I support a business that is creating change, a for-purpose business in India because I don't want to see our consumption hurt another place, another people group, just so I can have what I want. 
be it clothing, anything like that. I want you to think about ethics. Maybe it's fair trade coffee. Maybe it's ethically sourced clothing brands. I don't know. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and this won't be a problem to us. But the last and most important that goes with that scripture, and I'll finish with this tonight, is what would Jesus do if he was me? We've had the what would Jesus do movement. What would he do if he was you? with your circumstances, with your pressures, with your job, with the, with the family that you have, with the possessions that you have, this is a question you ask Jesus. What would he do if he was me in my position? Let's stand for prayer. Lord, tonight we are truly... Uh, humbled by your word and the call that you place on every single one of our lives to live in a way that honors you, that places you at the center of all we are. And the the call to simplicity is a call that's radical. And you called us as followers to be radical, to stand in the gap for those who are being oppressed and to live a different way, such a different way, that people might see you in our midst. And so tonight, I pray, Lord, that we might walk away from here with one thing, something we're going to attempt, something we're going to do for your kingdom and for your sake. And Lord, may we, may we step into that phase through the series, Lord, we're asking that question constantly. What, what do you want from us, Lord? How do you want us to... Um, to deal with not only our possessions, but our time. Where do we need to make space so that you can have a higher priority in our life and the things of this world a lower priority? Father, tonight I just pray that you would go and do that which you can only do by the power of your spirit to bring conviction, make us uncomfortable, and challenge us with the things that we know have raised up the ladder and dethroned you, Lord. So we ask, be gentle, Lord, but help us to start with one thing and move from there. We thank you, Jesus, for your, for your word and for your spirit, and we ask that you bless us now with insight and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name.